Our guest tonight is the seventh mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser, who last week was responsible for commissioning this incredible piece of art that was seen all around the world on 16th Street in her district. Muriel Bowser, thank you so much for finding Thanks, the time to join us on the show tonight. We're, we're so happy that you're here, and I, I know that your time is precious. So I want to go straight in and ask you, when did you decide to paint Black Lives Matter on that road in front of the White House? And what was it a message you were trying to send to the White House when you decided to do it? Well, we decided to do it after we reclaimed a street in Washington, D.C. that in the days previous, about uh, two or three days previous, the federal government had encroached on, on local Washington. Uh, and we were able to push them back to Lafayette Park, um, but we wanted to set um, a clear tone and message um, when we reclaimed those streets, that those are DC streets and they were there for peaceful protest. It's so brilliant. How do you even go about doing something like that? Whose idea was it? Well, we have an incredible team uh, and we do murals all the time. Uh, and we wanted to use art uh, as an expression of the country's mood uh, that we wanted to send the clear message that people shouldn't be scared of the police or killed by the police. And this is a moment in our history uh, to get this right. Uh, so our Department of Public Works our sanitation workers who are responsible for murals DC. Uh, we used the artwork that we commissioned with a, a great group of artists and went out there in the middle of the night and painted it. It's magnificent. And I think everybody felt that. Well, not everybody, because the same day you unveiled the mural, President Trump called you incompetent in a tweet. And I'm sort of, I'm wondering, what does it feel like when you wake up in the morning and the president has singled you out and tweeted about you in such a way. Well, um, I wasn't happy about it, but I I saw it coming. Uh, he had sent out a tweet in a couple of days before using really violent racist rhetoric, if you ask me. Uh, he warned that he would unleash vicious dogs and ominous weapons on the people of the District of Columbia. Uh, and for me, that's when he decided that he would bring the United States military as a show of force, as this, this showmanship, this bravado uh, to intimidate Americans. I mean, you're a mom, you have a, a, a two-year-old at home, yeah. uh, and you're there in DC, do you, do you ever have to brace yourself for what the president's going to say, for how he's going to react to decisions that you make and the manner in which he might do so? How does it feel for you around DC? Because I think if you're a mayor a long way away from the, the White House, yeah. that distance can, can provide some sort of cushion, I imagine. Yeah. I, I frequently say that we're in the belly of the beast. Yeah. Um, and because we're closed. Now, he typically has stayed out of local Washington. He hasn't really gotten involved in our affairs unless he doesn't get something that he wants. Um, and the last kind of Twitter tip he had with us was over um, doing a military parade. Uh, and so he's typically stayed out of um, out of things. But this is election season for us. Uh, we have a big election in November. Uh, so unfortunately, I think that the White House and the military was used for some so showmanship that had uh, should should never um, our military should never be used for those reasons. Well, I want to talk to you about because last Monday, obviously, we all saw the images of peaceful protesters. We're being tear gassed and firing rubber yeah. bullets. It then became evident that they were being hurt in this way so that the president, to clear the path of the president to have a sort of bizarre photo up holding a Bible outside a church. When does that get to you? When are you told that this is happening? Do you find out from the news or does someone come in and say, I think they're about to tear gas protesters? Well, I saw the tear gassing of protesters by federal police, not our local police. Yeah, absolutely. I want to make that distinction. Um, when the world saw it, uh, I saw I saw the, the the news clips of it, and then I saw of what the world also saw was this bizarre kind of 
holding of the Bible in front of uh, in front of a church. So what goes through your mind in that moment? Who are you with? And you, because it's your, it's your uh, district. We, we were we were all just stunned and and shocked and trying to figure out who would have ordered something like that. Uh, and that's that still remains a question um, that I think our Congress is going to have to find out. Uh, was a, a a chain of command established that was legitimate, uh, and who made uh, the order to use? And nobody is clear on what exactly was used, what type of gases or what was used. But who who made that order? So you still don't know where that order I, came from. There's there's some finger pointing going on right now as to who made the decision. Um, to move um, to move people away uh, from uh, Lafayette Park so that the president could cross the street. I mean, that's just mystifying to me. I can't really get my head around it. It is, it is mystifying, especially uh, in the way that we celebrate peaceful protests in our country. Attorney General William Barr wrote a letter on Tuesday, and which I'm sure you're aware of, where he said, the United States was on the brink of losing control of its capital city. That is, uh, that is the type of exaggeration uh, that we're accustomed to from, from the White House uh, to try to uh, prove uh, the use of force that they had decided to use days before uh, as evidenced by the president's warning of vicious dogs and ominous weapons. Uh, and in fact, and I hope that, I know you've had a chance to be in our beautiful city. I saw your karaoke with First Lady Obama. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we want you to come back and do it again. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is there there was uh, some destruction and looting in our downtown area and in a few places around the city, uh, but very, very localized and small amount of damage um, compared to the beautiful avenues and neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. Uh, so Washington, D.C was not on the brink of being lost uh, to a small band of people who weren't there peacefully protesting uh, in the early days, uh, but they were drowned out by all of the Americans who came down uh, to send the president the message that you will not use the United States military uh, in, uh, in, in America's cities. Now, lots of people right now are talking about and using this statement to defund the police. Uh-huh. You're in charge of the D.C. Police Department. Absolutely. Like, what do you think of, of that sentiment? Well, I think uh, I've heard a lot of people describe it different ways. Uh, and some want there to be no police at all. Um, and others want the police to be reformed uh, so that people aren't scared of their police. We have good policing in our cities and, and towns across America. Uh, and I uh, am responsible for public safety in this city. Uh, and I know that we have the number of police that we need. Uh, but I also know that's the only, uh, that's not the only part of the public safety equation. We also in, invest in social services programs and yeah. opportunity programs and ways to divert people from crime in the first place. I feel like the phrase defund the police is quite a scary thing to hear to yeah. like my parents, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I think actually, it's it's what what people really should be talking about is a, like you say, a, a reimagining of the police of what they mean in right. communities right. and a right. redistribution perhaps of those funds. Is that something that you'd agree with? And how do we go about changing the way that police are obviously working not just in DC across the country? You right. know. Well, I actually think that our police department uh, has been on the trajectory of reform for 18 years. When I grew up in Washington, D.C., we did have a very troubled police department. Uh, and we've worked long and hard as a city for the last 18 years. We entered into a decree with the Justice Department at the time, back in 2002, to reform our police department. So we've been doing it for 18 years. All of our police have body camera. All of our police are trained in de-escalation tactics. All of our police go to the Smithsonian Institution's African American Museum of History and Culture to really understand um, the role the police played in Jim Crow America. 
Um, so we think that we've instituted a number of reforms, including having an independent police complaints board that's independent of the police or the mayor where people can go um, to redress any issues that they have with the police. So what I recognize though, James, is the balance is it's a tenuous one. Um, the community and police relations have to be invested in and worked on every day because a single bad incident uh, can change that balance. So I don't believe every department in our country is in the same place. Mm. And there may be some out there that need to be completely dismantled and rebuilt, some cultures that have to change. Um, but I would dare say we are a long way in that process, but we recognize we have to work on it every single day. So why do you think it's hard for other mayors to not seem to be able to, to rein in the police in, in a way? It, sometimes, you, you, you know, that there, there feels to be that there's sort of authoritarian kind of um, attitude towards lots of police across the country. How, why is it that mayors can't rein them in and make those changes quickly? Well, it's hard to make changes quickly. Um, oftentimes, there are a lot of labor issues that we have to deal with. Um, sometimes there are financial constraints um, that you can't invest in raising salaries, for example, so that you're attracting the best of the best people. Um, some cities can't compete um, for the, the best of the best to do the work. Some mayor, and, and even in our town, James, we're constrained about um, how we can get rid of bad officers. And they're bad apples in every profession. Uh, and some of the laws and our agreements, our labor agreements, uh, tie our hands. So even if we had a very bad incident, uh, we would have to go through a process to fire an officer. And sometimes even when we do that, uh, an arbitrator can force us to take that officer back. So that's one thing um, that I've attempted to, to get changed in the law, and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, and there are all kinds of those types of things in departments across America that need our attention. Now, can I talk to you about coronavirus for a minute? Yes, of course. Is there any part of you that when, because I think lots of people feel conflicted in a sense, when because I think these protests are necessary and vital. Yeah. But at the same right. time, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Do you worry that in seven days, 10 days, 14 days time, we might see a spike in reaction to the, to the protests that have happened? Well, I wor I've been worried the whole time about reopening. Uh, yeah. And the one thing I've told everybody is reopening doesn't mean the virus has gone away. It just means now um, that our health system has the capacity to support um, people who get sick from the virus. We don't have a cure, we don't have a vaccine, and the virus is not gone. So any, any reopening, we're in phase one in our city, we hope to be in phase two uh, in the next week or so, but any reopening means that you can have more infection. Uh, and certainly mass gatherings of people um, can gives us great reason for concern. I've been worried about our troops moving all across the country, National Guard, in planes, on buses, in, in hotels, in bunks. I've been worried about them uh, traveling uh, during a pandemic in, in a way that was unnecessary. Uh, we encourage anybody who came to Washington, D.C., exercising their First Amendment right to use masks, wash their hands, uh, and to monitor themselves when they get home. I worry that there might be a spike and then the president will come out and say, well, it's because of these protests. We were just about to reopen and now we've right. got to lock down again. Do you know what I mean? Like, Well, it, he could say that, but that probably wouldn't be true um, because right now today there are protests. I, I mean, there are spikes, I think, in 14 states. With that, and yes. that is probably linked to early reopening and linked to uh, Memorial Day festivities. So the spikes have already happened from states and they're happening, we're experiencing right now. We're not having one because we didn't reopen early, uh, but in 14 places across the country, there are, they had, I think in Florida, their highest reported case day um, since the pandemic began. Now, obviously you and other states, you need, you need the president and Republicans help in securing 
relief funds for, you know, coronavirus. Do you ever worry, and I can't imagine this is something that would cross your mind in other administrations, that if you publicly criticise the president, that that you might not get the, the relief funds that it, that it needs from the president? Well, I mean, we have that worry every single day, but I think also the states and governors have that worry, that they can be strong-armed by this administration uh, to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, including sending their National Guard to the District of Columbia when we didn't uh, request it. Uh, so we work with our Congress. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has been uh, in very close touch with me. And I'm, I'm not one that gives up on Republicans. Uh, this is every lawmaker, Democrat and Republican has a responsibility uh, to do the right thing uh, for for all the 50 states, and we're gonna be the 51st state, by the way, uh, and they have a responsibility to do what's right. Do you think that will genuinely happen? Because I, like, I've only lived here five years, and I, DC, I know that this, you're very, very passionate about the fact that, that you feel DC yeah. should be the 51st state, and it makes complete sense to me when you see the volume of people that, that live there. Do you think it will actually happen? And how, how does it even happen? Whose help do you need? I, I do think it will ha happen. And what we have seen over the course of the last um, 10 days is now that America really sees the problem with it. Uh, 700,000 people live here. We all pay taxes, just like every uh, American in all the 50 states. We send our people to war. We're larger than two states uh, and very close in size to two others. Uh, and we pay more taxes than we get back from the federal government. We're actually a donor state. Uh, and so it is, it is ingrained in our, we think, in our birthright that we have representation in the Congress. Do you know, in the capital of the United States, our Congresswoman doesn't get to vote. Yeah, I, I literally found that out yesterday. Yes, but get this, in the capital of the United States, we don't have two senators. Uh, so when there are big discussions um, in when there are Supreme Court appointments and there are other advice and consent matters uh, in the Congress, we don't have a voice at all because we don't have two senators. So uh, it violates our principles of fairness and equal representation, just period. Uh, and you ask how it happens. It can happen with a simple vote in the United States Congress. In fact, every state outside of the first 13 colonies um, became a part of the union by a simple vote of the Congress. Uh, we have a bill in the House right now. Uh, what we have learned from the Republicans that are serving now and the president confirmed just a few weeks ago that for them, this is a partisan issue. We beat back all of their concerns about whether uh, it's constitutional or whether we can afford it as the city or whether we're competent enough to run our own affairs. We beat back all of those arguments. And so now it's just, uh, should there be more Democrats in the Congress or not? But that question is up to the voters. So this is really how it has to happen. Uh, we have to hold the House, the Democrats, win the Senate and get a new president. And uh, when all of those things happen, and it could happen, uh, I think the next president has to move our D.C. statehood bill in his his first 100 days. Can I just ask you one question? So you're you're there, you're in D.C. There'll be things you have to go to at some point in the next in the, in the next hundred days that you'll have to go to where you might find yourself in a situation where it's you and President Trump. What is that moment like? Is it frosty? Are you like, Mr. President? And he's like, <laughs> Mayor Bowser. And then you both sort of turn away and give like a eye roll and a ugh. Is it like that ever? Is, is, it, is it tense? I don't think I'm going to be in the same room with him, just in a social, <laughs> in a social environment or anything like that. And, um, I can't imagine uh, another reason why we would be in the same room. But if if we were, uh, and, and there may be an occasion where I need to call on him, and I would just say, Mr. President, this is this is what my issue is. Uh, and my experience with him is that uh, if if he's upset about something, he'll just let it let it out at that time. Thank you so much. We're going to Thank talk you. to you after the break. Stick around. More with Mayor Bowser when we come back. Now, Mayor, we've, we've been doing this thing on the show, a late, late show and tell, where we ask our guests if they would share something 
from their home or where they are that we'd ne otherwise never get to see. Do you have something you'd like to share with us this evening? Well, just a couple of things. Number one, and I know you wouldn't see this because this was sent to me by a voter. I hang it on the bathroom in my office. Uh, and it's an oath, uh, and it's a personal oath um, to the um, that I remind myself of. And I'll just read you the first line. I am here because people encourage me, embrace me, and believe in me. Uh, and it's signed the voter. Oh, that's fantastic. So I love that. But I have to show you another one I also keep in my office. And it's a pillow. Oh, look at that. And um, both of these things were sent to me by people I don't know. Uh, but this is just says 51 and a big exclamation point. And everybody who visits me at City Hall sees this. But this is a reminder that we have to work uh, for full citizenship and become the 51st state. That's uh, last magnificent. Thing, I keep this in my home uh, and I especially love it. This was also given to me by someone I don't know. It's Barack Obama uh, in, in, a, in a piece of art that uses newspaper headlines of uh, President Obama. And I love it now because it sits at the bottom of my steps. And my daughter, who is two, when she comes down the steps, she says, Barack Obama, Barack Obama. Well, so, that's amazing I because it. I've actually been making one of you, one of Trump for you. Oh, God. <laughs> which I know that you, will, that you would love to hang in your house. So I'll get that to you as soon as I can. Okay, <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Reggie, do you have a question? for our guest this evening? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, tonight's question goes to... Uh, let's make it for uh, Mayor Bowser. I'm assuming you're someone who enjoys a nice cup of coffee, maybe a croissant and a salad. If so, what is your vision for the future of humanity? <laughs> Whoa, it's a deep one. <laughs> That's a very deep one. My future is that we speak up and protect each other. Reg, is that correct? It absolutely is. It's absolutely correct. Thank you so much. Thank you. For joining Thank us you. on the show. Mayor Muriel Bowser, everybody. When we come back, Brandy Clark is going to be here with some music. Come on back, everybody.